Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's session on diaspora engagement. I'm very excited to, to be here with you also to share the best experiences and best practices that we have collected in the past year. Um, but first of all, let me welcome our distinguished panelists, excellencies, partners. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Today we're going to discuss diaspora engagement and the next steps that we will take together towards the constitution of the Global Diaspora, diaspora Policy Alliance. First of all, I would like to welcome Monica Goracci for IOM, His Excellency Ambassador Noel White from the Government of Ireland, and Dr. Charles Senesi from the Afro-European Medical and Research Network. So today, as you can see, we are going to have a multi-stakeholder consultation, which is important for um, the diaspora engagement agenda to keep on running. So it's a pleasure to have both um, our representatives from diaspora and the government and also international organizations. So we all um, are considering this ecosystem. Before starting the session, I just want to go through the agenda very quickly today. We will have three sessions, the opening remarks, then a technical presentation and then the discussion we, where we will invite you to be really active and participative because the idea of this consultation is to have as many feedback as we can to make this alliance as uh, reasonable for everyone and with the collective thoughts of everyone involved in this process. So with, you will see up for our um, partners and um, attendees online, you have also available translations in English, in Spanish and in French, also for the people here in the room. So without any further ado, um, I would give the floor to uh, Monica Goracci for IOM for her welcoming remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Larissa, Excellencies, distinguished guests, good morning from Geneva. I know we have uh, colleagues on, online. It's a great honor for me to welcome you here today, both in the room and, uh, and online, to this uh, multi stakeholder consultation on the creation of the future Global Diaspora Policy Alliance. The aim of our meeting today will be to discuss, discuss the establishment, the structure, and the scope of the Global Diaspora Policy Alliance in what we hope will be a open discussion with governments, diasporas, experts, other international organizations, UN agencies and key partners, including the private sector and civil society. Last year, the government of Ireland and uh, IOM co-hosted the first Global Diaspora Summit, which was a unique event that brought together member states, diaspora organizations and partners to discuss and set out future global agenda for action to support and strengthen the positive role that diaspora communities play for development and humanitarianism. The Dublin Declaration, unanimously adopted last year, identifies a path to maximizing diaspora engagement across the humanitarian development and peace nexus. And more importantly, it recognizes that policies and programs to maximize diaspora engagement must be people-centered and implemented through a multi-stakeholder approach. During the Dublin summit, we also learned that most success successful diaspora engagement programs have a sectoral focus and ensure sustained engagement over time. During the Global Diaspora Summit, a commitment was made to create a Global Diaspora Policy Alliance as a means of cultivating an inclusive ecosystem of collaboration across governments and key stakeholders to empower diasporas to be able to fully contribute to sustainable development. And it is hoped that the Alliance can really serve as a vehicle for diasporas and partners in the acceleration of the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which aims to stimulate action over this decade in areas of critical importance for humanity on the planet. IOM and its partners, we stand ready to act as the Secretariat and to facilitate the Global Diaspora Policy Alliance, whose purpose will really be to create a networked tool of expertise and exchange to complement existing facilities, prioritizing diaspora engagement in global development policy frameworks through high-level technical dialogue and exchange. The Alliance will 
also serve as a very important platform to consolidate achievements reached under GCM, the Global Compact on Migration Objective 19, leading up to a future second Global Diaspora Summit. So today, we're here to also look at what has been achieved since the Global Diaspora Summit and what we need to do to ensure that we co-create an environment where governments and partners can share best practices and targeted programs to accelerating the implementation of Agenda 2030. IOM has had the privilege over the years of working with key diaspora organizations and leaders and to witness really their potential and unique talent developing and implementing transnational initiatives for several decades. Since the 1970s, IOM has been implementing return of qualified national programs that serve to transfer the skills and the knowledge acquired by diaspora members abroad back to their countries of origin. This program then subsequently transformed in the early 2000s in, uh, in the Migration for Development in Africa, the MIDA initiative, and the temporary return of qualified national programs, which have evolved into multifaceted models that enable diaspora members to invest their skills and resources back home in their countries. Um, in their countries. Unfortunately, the time doesn't allow me to recognize each and every one of our partners across the globe or all the initiatives that are underway, but I would like to share with you just some of our most recent partnerships to demonstrate that diaspora contributes to, substantially to the acceleration of uh, uh, SDGs. For example, in the context of SDG 3 on good health and well-being, I am partnered with the Syrian American Medical Society, providing medical relief to the Syrian diaspora in need. The SANS creates partnerships and collaborations with other organizations to provide humanitarian response, save lives and alleviate suffering. And by delivering life-saving services, revitalizing health systems during crises and promoting medical education in Syria and beyond, the SANS has supported over 110 medical facilities and more than 3,000 medical personnel. Recognizing the SDG 5, on gender equality, I would like to share the example of Almas Negash, the CEO of the African Diaspora Network, an organization whose mission is to channel capital from the African diaspora into development through philanthropy, investment, and innovation. Almas has worked tirelessly to connect diaspora entrepreneurs living in the United States with their homelands through mentorship programs, access to financing, and training, and by inspiring young girls and women from the diaspora and demonstrating that through their diversity and uniqueness, diasporas drive innovation, Alma's work is promoting the empowerment of women. For the past 13 years, the African Diaspora Network has successfully developed and implemented entrepreneurship and health initiatives from Silicon Valley to the African continent, thanks to very key partnerships, exchange of best practices, and strong global networks of passionate people moved by their common heritage and sense of responsibility to give back. And, and finally, I would like to share some insights regarding SDG 13, focusing on climate action. By 2030, an estimated 700 million people will be at risk of displacement by drought alone, and about one third of global land areas will suffer at least moderate drought by 2100. 2100. How, how do we say 2100? It's got to be American. It, it, it's, it's so 2100. Yes. It, it's, so, it's, it's so far away. <laughs> you know? So taking urgent action to combat climate change and integrate diaspora as actors in mitigation and adaptation of transnational strategies is therefore imperative to save lives and livelihood. The purposeful, unconditional service to others, PUSO Foundation, a Filipino diaspora organization working with key partners, including IOM to rebuild shelters for families and responds to the effect of climate change. The organization has provided direct relief programs to communities in the Philippines affected by Super Typhoon Odette, including water, food, and non-food items such as shelter kits. So these are just a few examples of what we hope to build together. And through the Global Diaspora Policy Alliance, we aim to strengthen the dialogue between diasporas, governments, and relevant stakeholders. And as, as an initial point of action, 
Let's support diasporas and transnational communities to be fully recognized as development actors in the 2023 Sustainable Development Summit, reaffirming the commitment towards a just, equitable, sustainable, inclusive, and prosperous world by 2030. So today we have the opportunity to discuss how you envisage the structure and the scope of the Alliance, and together we will begin to pave the way for its establishment. So this is just the beginning of a long-term exciting and participatory mechanism that will continue to build together. So thank you very much for being part of the process and we look forward to the next steps. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you very much. And now I would like to pass the word to His Excellency Ambassador Noel White from the Government of Ireland. Larissa, thank you very much. Uh, Monica, thank you also. L ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, uh, good morning. Um, it's, it's good to be here. Thank you for this kind invitation uh, to, to be with you uh, today. Um, when, when Ireland was approached um, by IOM last year with a proposal to co-host the summit uh, on empowering diasporas to contribute to development, as is called for, of course, in, in Objective 19 of the Global Compact on Migration, the theme was one which resonated very deeply uh, for us. Um, Ireland uh, is deeply attached to its diaspora, um, a diaspora that is not only significantly outnumbers uh, the population on our island uh, and has done for some time, but one also that has made a major contribution to our development uh, and to the welfare of our people and continues to do so. Um, Ireland has, has changed, it has changed and developed significantly uh, in recent years, and our diaspora has played a crucial role in that in, in many respects. Uh, for example, uh, through investment in business, uh, through engagement in peace building, and indeed um, through the promotion of Irish culture and in many other ways. Um, Ireland has developed, in fact, to the extent now that it is a country of net inward migration. Uh, having for a century, having been for a cent over a century and a half a uh, country that people left in massive numbers uh, to seek a better life around the world. So all of that to say by way of introduction that the Global Summit, the Global Diaspora Summit, uh, was a very good fit for Ireland and I think the, the Dublin Declaration, if you can call it that, which has emerged from the summit, offers an agenda uh, for action to which Certainly Ireland is deeply committed and we look forward to taking this work forward with you and with IOM. Um, but when we met last year, we were very much at the start of a process, and this is reflected uh, in Monica's remarks um, this morning. Um, so now, a little over a year later, uh, we're at a point where we take that process to the next stage with the Global Diaspora Policy Alliance, or GDPA, as it is inevitably going to become known around Geneva. Um, this alliance, as Monica has said, it will be a forum for governments and partners in academia, in civil society and the private sector to collaborate in the longer term, beyond the summit, on diaspora policy and action in countries of origin uh, and countries of destination. I think it's important it's timely in that context to recall Objective 19 of the Global Compact, um, which refers to countries of origin, countries of destination, members of diasporas and the communities in which they live, recent arrivals and more established descendants of earlier arrivals. This is the platform on which we are operating. So we believe that the Alliance will allow us to exchange best practices to co-create, to, co to co-learn from each other about what works well, what works less well, to try out ideas and crucially to forge relationships. I think it's entirely appropriate in that context that this morning's event is a multi-stakeholder multi consultation and this multi-stakeholder inclusive approach is very much part of the DNA of the Alliance and should remain so. Um, so while for now nothing is set in stone at this stage in terms of the overall structures uh, of the Alliance, and I, th I, I think or I hope we would agree uh, that overall we would want to keep things relatively light and flexible but structured nonetheless and we can, we can uh, find the common ground between these two things. But I'm already happy to announce that um, uh, this morning that Ireland has had the honour uh, of being asked by uh, IOM, thank you Monica, uh, to take on the role um, of the first chair of the Alliance's Institutional Steering Committee. Um, this is an opportunity that we welcome 
um, uh, it's one we look forward to working on. It's a logical continuation, in our view, of the role we played in co-hosting last year's um, Global Diaspora Summit. So we look forward to doing that uh, with you. Um, I don't want to detain you too much, but just, so just to say finally, one, one of the most important lessons that, that we have learned, which might seem obvious, but nonetheless it, it bears repeating, um, from our own experience in Ireland, in engaging with our own diaspora, uh, is that countries of origin should not just see their diasporas as a resource to be drawn upon, but also you know, as a source of, as a, to be drawn upon as a source of remittances or investments or skills or other things. And it is many of these things, and that is important. Um, but we must also remember that the links that bind them to us are essentially uh, links of loyalty and affection. And that affection is not something that we take for granted. So it's essential in our view that our relationship with our diasporas should not only be one of partnership, but also su a supportive relationship. This is reflected and recognized in the Dublin Declaration in which we committed to support and nurture our diasporas, particularly the more vulnerable members, recognizing their needs as well as their potential to contribute to development. So that's the essence of true partnership, I suppose, a relationship from which all parties gain. Ireland is committed to playing its role in making this alliance work. Um, and we look forward to working with you and with IOM uh, to that end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador, for those remarks. Now I will give the floor to um, our uh, special guest today and hopefully partner in all the next uh, meetings that we have, Dr. Ch Charles Hennessy, representing a diaspora organization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair Lady. Um, Madam Director of Programs from IAM, His Excellency, the Ambassador of Ireland, and distinguished ladies and gentlemen, fellow diasporans online and in the room, um, I stand on existing protocols. I'm specifically honored to be here today to add my voice um, and to support this initiative of this Partnership for Diaspora Initiatives. And um, I represent the Afu European Medical Research Network, a network of um, professionals um, supporting health in their countries or continents of origin. And I've had a long time work with IOM since 2008 when I first met them and uh, in Geneva to a, a doctor called Anita Davis. And since then, we have been working together as colleagues, as partners. And then we in the diaspora, we are very much passionate about giving back to our countries, our continents of origin. But it suffices to say that in most instances, um, there is a reason why we took up these challenges. At times we are pushed into action, either by personal circumstances or by just the passion to help or just being there to make a change in the lives of people. And then I like to share my story of why I took up this challenge. It's a unique day for me because on this day, 42 years ago, I lost somebody very close in the family due to obstetric complications. And I decided that was 17th of May, 1981, young boy, I decided to become a medical doctor and to bring a change in the lives of people, not only as a doctor, but around the globe. And my story is not more different from others in this room. I can see Mary from Rwanda, who was pushed into action in 1994 after some upheaval in Rwanda. She formed the Rwanda Women's Network. And as a diaspora, she left here, Switzerland, to go back to Rwanda and I visited the project last year. It's running very well, especially in the health sector, which we are bound to support. And then I can see also Dr. Olabisi um, Adibaya also, who also found from Nigeria, the bridging the development gaps, so as to support the, the, the sustainable development goals. And we have a lot of engagement this week, which means that through the world of our own diaspora organization, together we can make it happen, which means um, like the Proverb in Africa, if you want to go far, um, you go as a group. If you want to go fast, you go alone. So we all believe in the, in the, in the, in the vision that together we can make it happen. And uh, back to our Amren, we run a lot of, of, of programs as a diaspora. And our basic vision is to 
generate knowledge sharing and exchange, which means we run uh, conferences, symposia, and other things here in the high level countries at the United Nations where we are accredited, etc. We sort of walk the talk by taking this our initiative onto the field as diaspora in the form of diaspora medical mission with mobile clinics, which is what the AMREN has become very, very, very um, famous for, or well known for. And then uh, we have we'll been doing it all over the country. I've been in this game for about 30 years now, even as a medical student, pushed by my passion of what I saw. And uh, along the way, we also will look at issues that we can actually home in on. For instance, a couple of weeks ago, I originally from Sierra Leone, 20 years in Switzerland. Um, we have a small community farm where one of our workers developed strangulated hernia, something that should not kill anybody. We ended up losing the, the, the man. We, the diasporans, came together. We have a, a colleague called um, James Bronson working for Toyota Gibraltar in, in the UK. We decided to say, we cannot allow any more person to die in this village because of hernia strangulation. So we went to screen the entire village. Of course, 10 or 15 more villages came together. And as I was talking now, those patients have been operated at the Kenema Government Hospital um, in, in Eastern Sierra Leone. Just to see how much where we diasporans come together, we can bring positive changes in the lives of people. For those of you who know Hania, Hania is like a stigma in most low and middle income countries because when once they have this Hania, which is like a defects in the, in the, in the, in the stomach that causes the gut to go down, they cannot do their normal um, farming. They cannot do their, their, it's a stigma. And so when once you cure them, you, you, you operate on them, you, become, you make the economically viable, you make the, bring back their respect in their lives. So last night, about the first 10 of them, we sent an ambulance. They are happily being operated today. That's the power of the diaspora coming together as a team, which is why we very much support these sorts of alliances that together we can synergize our efforts to really to maximize our output. And we very much support this initiative. And indeed, even when we go down to the low and middle income countries, we believe in building alliances because we, nobody has got the magic bullet. It's when you come together as a team, which is what I call on the diaspora, Hundreds of them are logging today, listening to what we are seeing here, to so join this alliance so that we can strengthen in what we do. We can actually reach out a lot of things that we can do. When we go down to the mobile clinics, we join hands with the local Ministry of Health. We are there to complement their effort. We are there to complement the efforts of the international organization in, in achieving the universal health coverage. We leave no one behind. So our mobile clinic is not only giving medications, we actually increase health awareness, we bring the younger colleagues on board, we, in, we, we improve on research, we bring the diaspora to collaborate, to introduce them back to their countries or continents of origin, so that slowly they can go and come, go and come, and by then we have introduced so many people. Last year I was in Rwanda with a colleague who's not been to Africa for 35 years, and then he's back in Rwanda, He's coming back to me to Sierra Leone. Another lady from um, Zambia was also for 33 years, not, not being back to her continent of origin. So it means we sought um, evidences, pieces of evidence of working together as a group with very much support this particular initiative. And I'll be very, very much part and parcel of it to bring together a lot of experience, a lot of colleagues who are logging today to join this alliance. And then uh, we could go on and on and on and on. But in short, we very much support this, this creator of this alliance and we hope that member states, that I mean, non-state actors, that everybody can actually home in in the true spirit that together we can make it happen. Nobody's got a magic bullet to solve all the problems of low and middle income countries. We share the same identity. So we, we need to come together in this sort of alliances so that at least we can maximize whatever we can do for the future generations to come. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Charles. I think it was an, a wonderful example of what diasporas can do and the power of connections and working as a team, as you were mentioning. So we will just take one minute because um, we will change the setting for the next session, which will be the technical one. But please um, stay with us for those connected and also the ones here in the room. Thank you.
So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Elizabeth Warren. I'm the head of the Labour Mobility and Social Inclusion Division with IOM's uh, HQ. Uh, it is a very great pleasure for me to be here with you today. Before we move into the next segment, which is the technical discussion, um, I would just to go, like to go through a few logistical points with you. Um, we have a coffee stand that you are welcome to bring your coffee into the room. After this session, we will have a short break before we move to the consultations. So you are also very welcome to do that at that point. Um, I am very delighted to let you know that we have a photo exhibition outside of the room where the results of successful partnerships with 22 representatives and Iberutas shows the winners of photos taken by professionals to show the ways in which diaspora have adapted when they leave their countries of origin and set up new relationships in their transnational lives. And I would urge you to take a look uh, after this session at the photo, wonderful photos that we've had from our panelists. For those of you in the room, uh, at the end of this session, we would like to welcome you for a lunch that will be held in the Wangari Mathai room on the second floor, and we will accompany you to that room at the lunch break. For those of you online, apologies that you will not join us for lunch, um, but we very much look forward to your active participation um, through the next two sessions. Uh, you are very welcome to leave comments in the chat. These will be um, reviewed as the two sessions go through. Uh, I uh, imagine that we will get many comments and so we may not have the opportunity to respond to all of them, uh, but please know that we uh, consider them as being very, very important to us and they will very much be part of the discussions and reflections that we have after the session. And then not only after this first session where we will talk through the outcomes and milestones since the Global Diaspora Summit, which His Excellency referred to, but we will also have a questions and answers session in the last session, which is the consultation itself, where we will discuss and have your feedback on what the GDPA should look like, who should participate and on what basis. So at this point, I would like to welcome to the floor my colleague, Larissa, Dr. Larissa Lara. She is the Transnational Communities and Digital Communications Officer, who will walk us through what has happened since Dublin and what are the major milestones that we have achieved together since that point of departure. Over to you, Larissa. Thank you. So, as Liz was mentioning today, it's a pleasure to share what we have really done together. So, IOM is um, welcoming all the remarks and everything we have done together, and hopefully we, we can discuss it in the, in the next session too. So, yesterday when I was preparing also um, for this presentation, I thought of um, starting it in a different way. So, today we have already listened to wonderful welcoming remarks. But basically, I really wanted to come up with a very tangible, concise image of what diasporas are and what they really bring to societies. So if we think about a bridge, and I really want you to visualize that bridge and keep it until the end of the session and also in the next discussions on how to build the Global Diaspora Policy Alliance, because I think we, we can really learn from, from this image. So what do diaspora brings, bring to societies, not only of origin, but also of destination? First of all, they reduce gaps and shorten distances. And if you think about it, it's just not from one point to the other, but diasporas have this potential, unique potential, to actually connect many countries. They are point A, but they can lead to many points on the other side of the bridge. The second idea that I thought would be very important to highlight is that diasporas, and thinking about that bridge, they maximize strategic connections. Once again, if you think about the bridge, they help us to connect people, to connect merchandise, to keep uh, flows, movement. So that's very, very true also for diasporas. And the third point is to escalate partnerships and reduce um, and resource mobilization, sorry. So again, with this idea of the bridges, I think diasporas really connect and help 
um, really be that vehicle that connect uh, countries of origin and countries of destination and even third countries. So um, now we're going back to the normal slides. I just wanted to share with you that visual um, image also considering that we're having the exhibition um, because I think it would be very nice to, to keep it uh, while we're discussing the next steps. So very concretely today, I will share with you some key frameworks that are um, basically framing all the work that we do from IOM and also together with partners. Then we're going to talk about some key resources that we have developed, uh, a little bit more about the Global Diaspora Summit, and finally, the next steps that will, um, will lead us to the, uh, towards the, the Global Diaspora Policy Alliance. Of course, we have already heard from the opening remarks that one of the key points that we have to consider while developing and enabling diasporas to connect with the home countries and host countries is Objective 19 of the GCM. Create conditions for migrants and diaspora to fully contribute to sustainable development in all countries. And diasporas have the potential to contribute to each of the SDGs. And we have seen it from today, from Dr. Charles' example, he's really focusing on SDG 3, uh, it's health and well-being. Diasporas have the opportunity with the, con with the correct resources to actually collaborate with us in all of them. In IOM, we're very um, happy to share with you this, um, this uh, approach on diaspora engagement, which we think it's really holistic because we consider diaspora capital in all of its ways. So social, human, economic, and cultural. Diasporas have a lot to give, and we have to recognize all of that. So that's why we are always thinking about this holistic approach to diaspora engagement. We have a three-year strategy that we call. The first step to really engage with diasporas, it's the, the pillar that we call engage, which is to understand and align their needs. This is very important because from the beginning, we need to collect data that will allow us to develop specific programs and specific policies. We have different tools. Um, we have, for instance, um, the Diaspora Mapping Toolkit, but we have also developed a specific um, strategic communications uh, and outreach for diasporas. And we have a platform where we try to, to create those spaces of collaboration. Um, the second pillar is to enable. By enabling, we mean concretely formalize and structure the relationship with diasporas. How can they participate in a more integrative way? And how can we recognize them as development actors? This is important because when we do things in a structured manner, as was highlighted by Ambassador from Ireland today, we can really um, target our audience and co-create things more concretely together. Finally, empower. This is the final stage. And what does it mean? To collaborate and implement um, activities together with the diaspora. So in order to do this, we have different tools and materials that focus on capacity building from a sectoral engagement. Here are, uh, in, a, in a very quick summary, some of the key tools that we have developed and methodologies at IOM. The first one is targeting states. So this is very important for me to, to actually share with you. When, when you have all of, of these materials, you have to think of the end user. So some of these are really uh, for governments. Some of them are for diaspora. Some of them are also for academics. So this is um, something that really leads our work as IOM, that multi-stakeholder approach. And I'm very happy to announce that even some of them have been developed hand in hand with diasporas. For instance, the third one, which is build trust, mobilizing resources and ensuring sustainability. This was coordinated with multiple diaspora organizations and even with academics. So that multi-stakeholder approach is possible. Um, and I'm, I, and this, these particular publications, uh, all of them are accessible in iDiaspora, but this particular publication was to really come up with concrete solutions of self-identified problems by diasporas. When we engage with diasporas, they always say there is a matter of trust that we, sometimes the trust element is not there. We don't have resources and we cannot ensure our sustainability in the long time. So that's why we decided to focus specifically on, this, on these topics, listening to those voices of the diasporas. Finally, just one comment on the two last resources that you see on screen, contributions and counting. 
is one guidance that we have developed um, together with uh, uh, experts um, to measure the contributions of diasporas beyond remittances. So diasporas are great in terms of investing, trade, tourism, and how do we measure that? Contributions and counting, it's a guidance that helps governments to do that. The Diaspora Mapping Toolkit, it's the final resource that I will introduce, it's a, an holistic um, mapping tool that really guides step by step any user to conduct their own diaspora mapping. Again, with that holistic approach, it really uh, accentuates the need to contextualize mappings. So these are the, the tools that we have produced at IOM. Um, together with different partners, again, we have developed three courses online that are available for everyone. Um, the Diaspora Mapping Toolkit, the Diaspora Empowerment from a Gender Perspective View, and finally, the Diaspora Module in the Global Migration Media Academy. Finally, uh, one of the most exciting things I would say in our job, at least from, from my really personal perspective, is the way to do innovative things. So last year we had the, um, yes, I would say even the luck to, to be able to work with young diaspora leaders. So we outreach these 10 diaspora leaders that are really contributing to specific sustainable development goals, and they are contributing to the development in the countries of origin and in the countries of destination. So there are key leaders. Um, that can be outreached and we need to maximize what they are doing and reach out to, to other partners to really see the impact of their initiatives. Then we have also um, had the chance to do a third virtual exchange to see how um, diasporas can actually communicate in a strategic way in the project cycle. So from the idea to the pitching to the implementation and also monitoring and evaluation. So it's important to start uh, considering diasporas as partners, and that's why we decided to focus on these specific areas. I will go quickly on this slide just to show you some of the key results that we have been able to, um, to do together with partners from the iDiaspora platform. Some webinars, high-level events, and publications. Now, um, we're going to discuss what happened at Dublin last year and the Global Diaspora Summit specifically. The Global Diaspora Summit um, was a unique event in the sense that for the first time diasporas with their governments hand in hand had the chance to talk on the same table and discuss the necessities and also the worries, the opportunities and what they could do to enhance and maximize their, um, their collaboration basically. So we held three regional consultations, 14 sessions online and seven parallel events where UN agencies and other stakeholders had the chance to also participate and organize their own events. We had more than 700 participants and we also had the opportunity to discuss specific sessions and cross thematic uh, areas such as data, humanitarianism, youth, digitalization, gender and climate change. So in this unique space of collaboration, we had the chance to discuss very openly what's, what needs to be done to engage diasporas at different levels, from the local to the global level. And I'm going to share with you key um, conclusions from the Dublin Declaration, but I, I, I would invite you to, to also um, uh, have a look at it in the sense that it's a very specific document. It really has uh, key messages, but also concrete steps that we need to take to construct the Global Diaspora Policy Alliance. The first point would be to institutionalize diaspora participation in policies and programs from the global to the local level. In, in, in my time at IOM, it has been really fruitful and honestly, it's one of the passions that really drive me to see how, how local communities communicate with, region, with the regional level and then we're able to do global tools. So this is something we're also focusing on. The second point would be to recognize diasporas as partners in addressing social and humanitarian challenges and also to boost their capacities. Diasporas can help, as we have seen already in, across the SDGs, but also in humanitarian settings. And we need to be prepared to mobilize them when that's needed, their support is needed, their expertise is needed. The fourth point would be to keep a strengthening the protection of rights of migrants and access to services 
as well as to keep strengthening and digitize diaspora networks. Finally, one of the key conclusions of the Dublin Declaration is to launch the Global Diaspora Policy Alliance, and that's why we are here today. So um, just to give you a very quick recap of, of what has been achieved since Dublin, together with partners and specifically with the government of Ireland that have, they have been very supportive in this process. First of all, the Global Diaspora Summit in April last year, then we had the chance to do a, to organ, to co-organize a side event at the IMRF, then a side event at the United General Assembly in September last year, and today we're here to discuss the Global Diaspora Alliance. So with this, I will give the floor to, um, to Liz again, um, that she will guide us through the consultation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larissa. And before we move to that last section, um, I will open the floor very briefly for any questions or comments on the presentation that Larissa has given so far. And again, if there are questions that you have, uh, Germany, you have your hand up. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I, I, I would like to take this opportunity to first of all thank you for organizing this very important meeting uh, on the role of the diaspora and on the creation of the Global Policy Alliance uh, for Diaspora. Germany welcomes very much that idea of the creation of the Global Policy Alliance. I think it's important um, for us uh, and for everyone here to integrate the valuable contributions of diaspora organizations into the formats of global migration management and cooperation. We are all aware that the diaspora organizations are important partners when it comes to the integration of refugees and migrants in the countries of destination but also with regard to the transfer of the skills and achievements of migrants to their countries of origin. German government has established many venues of cooperation with many organizations of diaspora which exist today in Germany. They are important partners when it comes to implement programs of integration, but also concerning the implementation of projects in the field of development cooperation with countries of origin. And against this background, I would just like to reiterate that we welcome the creation today of the Global Diaspora Alliance, which should help to implement the objectives of the Dublin Declaration and to give to the future cooperation between all relevant stakeholders in that field a very solid basis and structure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Germany, for your commitment to Dublin and to the recommendations for the creation of a Global Diaspora Policy Alliance. Um, do we have any more interventions before we pass to our consultations? Um, we have one question online, so I'll read it to you. Do we have a draft vision and mission statement for the Global Diaspora Policy Alliance? So I think this is a good segment into our last session where we start the consultations and in a few seconds I will bring up the uh, proposed scope. Uh, but beforehand, we have a few inspirational words from our Deputy Director uh, General Uguchi Daniels, who would like to say a few words on behalf of the organization. Uh, she has uh, developed a video message, so it, we will project this short message now. Good afternoon, distinguished guests. Diaspora are at the heart of IOM, and IOM has been working with member states, diaspora, and other partners for several decades to ensure that migration can benefit all. Today, we're working towards instituting and reinforcing collaborative effort where the diaspora can gain access to the necessary resources, networks, and partnerships to fully contribute to sustainable development. In 2022, IOM, in cooperation with the Government of Ireland, supported the first Global Diaspora Summit. This was a seminal moment which brought together government, diaspora representatives, 
international organizations, the private sector, academic and key experts to discuss how together we can cultivate an inclusive ecosystem of collaboration across governments and key stakeholders to empower diaspora to be able to fully contribute to sustainable development. The outcome of this global summit was the Dublin Declaration, which provided a series of recommendations for states, diaspora, and partners, including the creation of the Global Diaspora Policy Alliance to create this sustainable and structured ecosystem. In Dublin, 29 governments and the African Union expressed their support of the Dublin Declaration that identifies a path to maximizing diaspora engagement and specific solutions to well-known challenges in diaspora engagement such as data collection, trust building, and capacity development. Today, we're here at this technical consultation to reaffirm the commitment made in Dublin to establish the Global Diaspora Policy Alliance, to discuss how we can collectively establish the alliance, including its scope and structure. In doing so, we will reflect on the progress made since the summit last year and seek your support for the recommendations made in the I'm therefore delighted to welcome you to this multi-stakeholder consultation on the Future Global Diaspora Policy Alliance. In order to have an effective and inclusive alliance, we must ensure that it is based on a multi-stakeholder, people-centered and sectoral approach. These are the principles set out in the Dublin Declaration and have been articulated through numerous consultations I've had the pleasure of attending, including most recently, the Global African Diaspora Symposium held in Abuja this April, co-organized by the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States, the Nigerians in Diaspora Commission, the Directorate of Technical Cooperation in Africa, and the African Diaspora Alliance. I invite you to be open and frank on how you envision the establishment of the Alliance. We're here to learn from your experience, listen to your suggestions, and together lay the foundation for the first global structure that truly recognizes diaspora as partners. Thank you for your continued commitment, interest, and most important of all, action. So as we heard from our Deputy Director General in her words of welcome, today is the point of having that open and frank discussion. And in many ways, we are not here to tell you how we want to create this, but really to have a process of co-creation on what this alliance should look like. Now, the previous comment was, what is the objective and expected outcomes? Well, the expected outcomes we are here to co-discuss, and so I will not present that per se. But going to the core of what the objectives of the Global Alliance are, they derive from what was committed to and discussed and co-created at Dublin. And what we see in the Dublin Declaration, there is a recommendation, and I will read this, to facilitate the launch of a Global Diaspora Policy Alliance that will deliver an inclusive ecosystem of collaboration across governments in partners in academia, civil society and the private sector to prioritize diaspora engagement, policy making and action in countries of origin and destination. This will further recognize and include diaspora engagement across local, national, regional and global policy agendas relating to all forms of development. Next slide, please. So what I would like to present to you very briefly, and then I will set out um, the suggested modalities for our consultation, is very briefly what we foresee. 
Now, the ambassador mentioned this morning that he uh, welcomes the role of Ireland as the first chair of the Institutional Committee. Um, this will be, this is suggested as the body that will take strategic and technical advice on the structure of activities of the Global Policy Alliance, including recommendations to, a te to technical working groups and the potential organization of ad hoc meetings and events to maximize the impact of the GTBA. So what we are proposing is a structure where governments come together with partners to set the direction over the next few years of how we take forward the, um, the SDG objectives, particularly with reference to the GCM Objective 19, in a way that can be done in this collective manner, reflecting global, regional and national priorities. That institutional steering committee will be supported by some form of stakeholder advisory group that can include a broad range of different partners, academia, experts, diaspora members, and other entities that wish to be part of this process. And then we would suggest the inclusion of the observers, technical experts, and guests based on the priorities set by the steering committee. Now, at this stage, we would really appreciate your reflections on the overall structure and particularly on the areas of intervention that the Global Diaspora Policy Alliance should focus on. In the intervention from Monica Goracci, uh, she mentioned three areas that are echoed from the first consultations in Dublin, which could be climate action, a particular global of particular global interest at present, given the um, significant impacts of climate change across the board and on achieving the SDGs. We hear, heard this morning about the importance of health from our first intervention from Charles Hennessy. Um, and we also talked to the points of the importance of transversalizing gender and youth. However, as the ambassador also indicated, um, this is a consultation. So we would like to hear from you where you see the priorities being and whether the proposed structure meets those expectations. As I said, this is a consultation, so we welcome your inputs. Now, the proposed suggestions of how we move forward with the consultation is really to hear from you. And therefore, as I said, what we're presenting to you today is the early conceptualization of what the GDPA could look like, it is a draft that's been prepared with the feedback and strategic conclusions of events and conferences that have taken place across the world. And our Deputy Director General referred to a tiny percent of what those consultations have been or those discussions have been. And obviously, there are very significant discussions happening at different levels. What we also heard is that diasporas can act as an accelerator for the achievement of the SDGs. And this is where we would ask for your feedback on where the most effective and impactful transnational initi initiatives are from a sectorial perspective. Focusing, as I said, potentially on the three themes we would like to bring to the table, health and well-being, climate change and gender. But we also aim to use this as the process of co-creation. So in doing so, what we would like to have in this discussion is a series of questions that we will ask to you. And then in order to be as inclusive as possible, we're asking participants to be brief, concise, and to the point. We will ask the interventions be limited to no more than two minutes to give the opportunity to all, all stakeholders to express your views and to ensure a wide diversity of participants here to present your inputs. Now, we also appreciate for the governments in the room um, that this is a consultation that you have been part of from Dublin. But for many of you, this is also a point of reflection and that we appreciate that you may not be in the position to give official statements or feedback at this point. Um, to indicate, as I will do later, the next steps will be to take the contributions that you have made today, and then to make a proposal concretely of what the GDPA would look like. Uh, but we welcome even questions and comments on where you see 
the global discussion going, perhaps with reflections from your own national experiences, and perhaps with reflections also from how you see regional, other regional processes contributing to this discussion. So what we shall do, and I appreciate that we are running quite late, so apologies for that, is we will project some questions. We will take a few comments and questions, and then we will move to the next question. And once again, I appreciate what we are presenting to you is a very initial consultation. So please also ask questions to us. Now, as this is a co-creation process, it may not be at this point that we will answer those questions because we will bring together the different thoughts of opinion and suggestions coming from the room and coming from online and from other processes. But we will document everything that comes in for a more in-depth reflection. So at this point, I will start with the first, we have, I think, six questions. The first of six questions, and again, you are very welcome to add in the chat or from the room additional questions that you would like us to address as part of the broader consultation leading to the GDPA formulation. So I will start with the first question. What would be your expectations for the Global Diaspora Policy Alliance and the benefits it will provide? And here, understanding, as we heard earlier, that this can be a forum, as the ambassador said, to share ideas, best practices, lessons learned, elements that perhaps have not worked so well, but also potentially as a forum for exchange, networking, and for building partnerships. So I open the question out, what would be your expectations for the GDPA? And what benefits can it provide? I see there is uh, one hand up from the audience online. So when it's hybrid, it's also a little bit complex to, to make and, and ensure that everyone has a voice. But Marisa Tomata, please, can you, can you tell us what would be your, your thoughts in this? And Thank apologies, you. Marisa, before you do so, if you could please introduce yourself briefly, tell us uh, where you are from and also explain very briefly your uh, background and rationale for participating in this consultation. Thank you. Seems like we have a technical glitch. So perhaps, Marisa, if I can ask you to write your question and we can read it out. Thank you. We have a hand up from Rwanda in the room. Thank you. Um, so while our participants uh, can write the question in the chat, I'm just going to read the comments that we got. Uh, apologies. We have Rwanda in the room and we will ask uh, states in the room uh, first. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for having given us this opportunity to be in a in a, such a kind of conversation. Uh, my name is Mary Barikungeri. I come from Rwanda. And for many years I've lived here, then got an opportunity of going back home to give back. Uh, what I find very interesting here is this opportunity to now allow diaspora to really be able into conversation with the governments. It's very, very, very important. And I congratulate Dublin Summit and the IOM that has brought this up. But my question to this conversation is, having lived in diaspora, one of the experiences that have failed is we are caught up in our own cages when we are here. I'm wondering how this policy is going to begin from that route of engaging, mobilizing the immigrants who are in this kind of circle to really get them into the feel of what we are feeling in this room. So how is the awareness going to be able to trickle down like here in Switzerland? Migrants, I can't see some of them really seeing themselves here. 
So how do we bring about the mobilization, the awareness for them to feel that they can engage with their governments on issues that really concern them and that way they get into the thinking that they also matter to the policy, the global policy, to their government's policies and also to allow them to have the opportunities to engage with their governments because some of the governments might never want to engage with the diaspora. I'm fortunate coming from Rwanda is our diaspora is extremely active and the government policy is to want to engage them meaningfully. So how do we, what kind of mobilization are we going to take back to the ground, especially in the, these countries where we are as migrants? Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rwanda. Namibia. Good morning. Uh, my name is Miriam Nicodemus. I'm responsible for the IOM desk at the mission of Namibia. I have just arrived recently in Geneva, a few months ago. Uh, my question is on the consultation. Uh, First of all, I would like to thank IOM really for organizing these consultations. But my question is, since that we are getting the questions now in terms of the consultation, will we be able to be given some opportunity to reflect on them and then submit our feedback after the session? Thank you. Thank you, Nebibia. Are there further questions in the room before I I will not attempt to answer everything. As I said, this is a consultation, but a few reflections. Oh, apologies, Nigeria. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Watam from the Permanent Mission of Nigeria. I would like to take this opportunity to thank IOM for organizing this um, very important uh, meeting, this very important consultation. Um, as you know that Nigeria, we have a large number of Nigerian diasporans around the world. Um, I think we have an estimate of more than 17 million. So this uh, diaspora engagement is really important to us. Um, and just as DDD Daniels also mentioned, Nigeria hosted a uh, recently an African diaspora symposium, which um, brought stakeholders from across uh, the globe. So this is a very important subject to us. Um, one of the, the comments I would like to make uh, regarding what we expect to see, I think it should be um, uh, inclusive. The diasporans themselves should be included in the conversation. Um, I think that that is how we can clearly um, figure out and identify what their specific needs and concerns are. And then that is how also we would chart a way to address those issues. Um, I think also it is important that in creating this um, diaspora alliance policy, that um, due cognizance is taken to existing national and regional policies because um, I think that there are already existing national policies and regional policies in on this subject and it would be um, ideal to take that into consideration. Um, I think also it is important that we had we have uh, a wide thematic area um, so that um, in our discussions and our policy framing we can take into consideration various aspects, like you mentioned earlier, the climate action. It would be good to also have, in, in Africa, we have a very large youth um, population. Uh, you know, if we're, if we're going to have an inclusive conversation, then we need to have um, cross-cutting and wide thematic areas to include. Um, I think I will stop there for now. Thank you. Nigeria, thank you so much. We also have a participant from the back of the room. I apologize, I'm, I'm not sure from which entity you are or state you are from. Thank you. Thank you, I'll introduce myself. Um, my name is BC Adebayo and I, am, um, I run an organization here called Bridging Development Gaps. I'm also a director with the um, Afro-European Medical Research Network of Dr. Senesi. 
Um, I would like to commend IOM for this um, brilliant initiative. Um, it's a known fact that diasporans have really contributed a lot to the development of our countries of origin. So, um, but coming here this morning, I, you know, would have expected a wider network, you know, of NGOs that are already working in this space, you know, contributing to development and the furtherance of SDGs back in their countries. So what are the plans? I, I, you know, I already got the feeling of what the Dublin policy is all about, you know, very good initiative for networking, sharing of ideas and all that. So how do you intend to broaden the network to get more um, organizations involved? So like, like, you know, this kind of event today will have more participation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before we move to our colleagues who are online, um, just a few reflections on the questions asked so far. And I will start with the feedback from Rwanda and the excellent point about how to raise awareness. Now, clearly, this is very much how uh, something that we will have to do collectively together uh, once the package is put together. But I think it raises a fundamental point about um, how the different levels of interventions will work and the same point came from Nigeria about how do we link to national regional policies the global network is to will complement and build on those existing networks so it will not replace or or um, or or create any additional structures at either of those levels. It will be for the national and regional process to feed into the GDPA. How we do that, we will have to look into more detail, but we certainly recognize and appreciate the numerous states that have put into place diaspora policies or have transversalized issues of diaspora and migration across the different policy areas and have mainstreamed migration across the board. So all this to say absolutely that this will be done, uh, we recognize that there will be cross-sectionality between different areas. I think we will have to be realistic in terms of the different areas, sectorial areas that we focus in on. Um, we had suggested three because um, they seem to come from previous discussions as being those where most of the actors are saying we need transformative change, but there can certainly be others. And so we very much take note of that point from Nigeria and, and appreciate your feedback that both climate and youth are critical and indeed would suggest indeed that these areas be very much reflected into the GDPA. Um, to the feedback from Namibia, you are absolutely right. Um, this was to come into next steps, but what we foresee, and I will say this already now, is that after the consultation, we share with you a package of information, the presentations from day to day, the Dublin Declaration, the questions themselves, and we will create a mechanism of feedback to take this forward. And th this mechanism to take it forward will then be the basis for the GDPA um, proposal itself. What we would aim to do is to use the summer months to create this and then we will revert to you on the next steps of how this will be uh, finalized and then launched and then to our colleague from uh, ngo yes uh, you will see that we have networks of organization online um, the identification of those organizations was done uh, based on the uh, participants from Dublin itself, but also from a really wide range of partner organizations that we work with already. And here it's important to underscore the importance of iDiaspora Network. There is a, a website where diasporas continuously and other organizations can contribute to the dialogue that's online and continuously monitored. So that already exists. And how we bring in other actors will be part, part of the conversation moving forward. I see that we have two representatives online. Uh, Aya Kasasa, uh, if you could please raise your question or comment. Oui, bonjour. Je ne sais pas si vous m'entendez. Oui, on vous entend. Bonjour, bonjour. Merci beaucoup de, de, de bien vouloir me donner la parole. Et puis, je, je souhaitais bien entendu commencer par euh, remercier vivement l'Organisation internationale euh, pour les migrations pour cette invitation et puis pour cette occasion euh, 
euh, unique de pouvoir euh, nous exprimer et échanger dans ce cadre. Euh, je tiens aussi à remercier la directrice générale adjointe qui a fait référence euh, au, au Symposium mondial sur la diaspora africaine qui vient de se tenir à Abuja au Nigeria euh, les 27 et 28 avril dernier, auquel l'OIM a contribué euh, à, avec, avec l'OEACP et les autorités nigériennes et euh, qui a abouti, dont les conclusions sont contenus dans un communiqué que je vais partager avec vous en ligne. Par rapport à la, cette première question sur la consultation que vous avez posée, euh, quelles seraient nos attentes Je pense qu'il euh, est important pour l'EACP, nous nous représentons 7, 79 États membres répartis sur trois continents, c'est-à-dire des diasporas très différentes, euh, en, euh, très différentes les unes des autres. Alors c'est surtout aussi cette idée de ne pas euh, d'éviter les redondances, de, 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 que, que l'Alliance puisse vraiment être une caisse de résonance de l'existant. Il existe, comme vous l'avez euh, très bien fait remarquer, énormément d'initiatives déjà en cours, beaucoup de gouvernements qui travaillent déjà sur ces questions-là eh bien, si l'Alliance pouvait contribuer à faire connaître euh, mieux euh, l'existant, en fait. Euh, et puis, la, la, la question, une des questions dont il a été, euh, euh, qui, qui, a, qui a animé les échanges à Abuja, c'est beaucoup cette idée de construire la confiance entre les diasporas et leur pays d'origine. Comment est-ce que cette alliance pourra euh, appuyer euh, la, la construction, la consolidation euh, de, de, de cette confiance Et puis, je reprends, je saisis l'occasion donc des, des représentants de la diaspora qui ont parlé depuis la salle euh, comment faire en sorte que euh, notre alliance puisse sortir des cercles institutionnels et de ceux qui les connaissent. Ceux qui sont là, c'est ceux qui connaissent assez bien nos cercles institutionnels. Il y aura un effort à faire pour pouvoir euh, ben, joindre ces associations euh, qui, et, et, et ces formations qui ne nous connaissent pas encore et qui pourront contribuer euh, valablement euh, à, ces, à cette alliance. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, euh, Madame Aya Kassassa. C'est un plaisir d'avoir vos commentaires. Et bien sûr, euh, nous sommes très, très conscients de tous les efforts qui ont été déjà faits et on vous remercie aussi auprès de l'OIM. Et euh, en, en termes de vos questions, je pense qu'on va continuer à travailler ensemble, surtout pour, euh, pour l'implémentation de, de, la, de la plateforme sur Internet que vous, avez, euh, vous êtes en train de construire. Et je pense qu'on peut directement créer des synergies avec, avec cette plateforme. Et en ce qui concerne le the trust, euh, j'oublie le moment en français maintenant, mais euh, la, confiance, la confiance avec la relation des diaspora. Je pense que c'est un, euh, il, il un effort qu'il faut faire tout le temps. Ce n'est pas juste entre le gouvernement et les diasporas, mais il y a aussi euh, plusieurs organisations de, des Nations Unies, l'OIM et beaucoup plus d'autres partenaires. Même dans l'aspect privé et le secteur privé, il y a des gens qui sont diasporiques. Donc vraiment, on peut construire euh, en, en touchant à ces personnes-là euh, beaucoup plus de dynamiques, de confiance et de vrais partenariats. Donc je pense que vos réflexions sont, sont absolument correctes et on va les prendre en compte pour les, les pas qui suivent pour la construction de l'Alliance. La, de Merci beaucoup. Et maintenant, je vais donner la parole à Paddy uh, Siyanga, uh, joining also online. Thank you very much. Paddy, we could not hear you. Um... If you have technical difficulties, you're very welcome to leave your comment online or your question online. Um, hello, can you hear me? I can, yes. Uh, if you could keep your intervention very short. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't see uh, that I was asked to unmute from my screen. Thank you so much. Uh, Patty Sianga Knudsen from the Global Research Forum on Diaspora and Transnationalism. And I, uh, I, I, I would also say I, I, I sign myself as part of the African diaspora uh, belonging to, to, to Zambia um, uh, and joining you here from Kosovo. Thank you so much for the opportunity for us to be here. I just wanted to really maybe uh, uh, join my voice uh, in terms of uh, also reflecting into the points on uh, uh, an inclusive process uh, and maybe just to go very directly to a proposal that I think that while this consultation here 
has been very useful in getting an introduction to what the aspirations uh, for the, uh, the, the Global Diaspora Policy Alliance would be. What would even be much more critical is to have a very dedicated uh, session with diaspora organizations and the diversity of diaspora actors. And I say this with a lot of due respect and um, uh, both uh, Larissa sitting there knows the important work that we have done together. I'm glad to have seen most of it also being uh, shown visibly on the screen and throughout the presentation. But I think we cannot take for granted the fact that you need a dedicated session with diaspora because nothing can happen Nothing can nothing nothing much more effective and productive would happen without the diaspora and speaking on behalf of the white diversity. And here I think that it's very important for us to look at uh, uh, diversity beyond remittances, diversity also beyond uh, the, the, the sort of natural partners that we have, but also thinking about the youth, the women, and other uh, and other groups that that form uh, the wider diversity on diaspora. I also wanted to bring in points I think that are related to which diaspora we're talking about, and specifically when we talk about the African continent, I, I think in a lot of senses we often speak about a diaspora that we see away from the continent. So how, in terms of you know, when you talk about benefits and opportunities, how do you sort of see this alliance really positioning? that diversity in terms of representation as well. So how do we talk about diasporas that are present on the continents as well? As we know in most regions for Africa, for instance, a lot of movement or those who are living uh, diasporas would probably predominantly be around uh, in, the, in, in the region itself, apart from the vast amount that is also away from the continent. So what space do we see in engaging with these? And I think the examples that have also been given uh, of platforms that have been created are very important. Very lastly, I think that it's also very important for us to, to look at regional initiatives, but also to understand that as we are drawing in regional national initiatives, I think we go back into thinking, how is this platform going to be important for us to move some of the very difficult discussions that, um, that diaspora cannot have with uh, the variety of partners, whether we're talking about private sector or whether we're talking about you know, building better relations with, with, the, with the diversity of governments that are there in terms of implementation of uh, global compact for migration uh, objectives that are specific to the diaspora, but also particularly in terms of priorities that are being raised in other platforms, such as the priority for diaspora under the Global Forum on Migration and Development, where France has put uh, uh, the discussion on diaspora as a priority as well. Where do we sort of see that alliance also with the work that is already happening under the UN Migration Network? So in short, uh, an additional platform is always very useful, but I think it's as it, it should be very useful in terms of driving already some very specific agendas that are placed out, both looking at the grassroots organizations, and that is the diaspora themselves and the actors, and what is really important and difficult for them to move forward, but also in terms of what is happening uh, on, the on the global platform as well. Thank you so much, and looking forward to dedicated sessions where we can share a little bit more uh, on how the diaspora can support uh, this alliance so that it's much more representative of the, of the actors on the ground. Thank you. Paddy, thank you so much. I will not attempt to answer the questions, but just to flag the points you have raised, which is a dedicated session with diaspora, um, to look at diaspora and how they position on the continent, the African continent, and how we address difficult discussions that, that, that cannot be had in the forums that exist. And then finally, the link to the UNMN. Now, I'm very mindful of your precious time. And as I had indicated, this is the start of a process, so uh, we will very much appreciate feedback coming in. What I would suggest we do, we have three more questions from participants online. I would ask that the participants online write their questions into the chat, and we will move to the next question. What I will aim to do is to close indeed at 12.30, but I would like to go through as many of the questions as we have possible and then to solicitate further feedback after this process as a next step. So apologies to those colleagues who had their hands up. We will now move to the next question. And again, I would very much invite both participants in the room, but also online to raise your questions and your comments. And if I am unable to select you, please do put those comments in the chat and we will provide you links afterwards to provide further feedback. So now we will give the floor to Paolo Correira next. Or, okay, sorry. Next question. Yeah, apologies, Paolo. We, what, what I was saying was we will go through the questions and then for those, those that, 
In order that we have as many questions posed as possible, we will go through two or three questions. And then for others that are not able to respond or raise the intervention now, we will take them online, simply to allow uh, as many questions as possible to be raised. Thank you, colleagues. Next question is, what is the best way to ensure a multi-stakeholder approach to the Global Diaspora Policy Alliance? Now, I appreciate that several of these, question, these comments have already made in other questions. So I think what we can do for this one is perhaps go to our colleagues who are already on, first in the room and then go to colleagues online to see if we can reflect on this question as well. We have comments from the room first from our states. Okay, in which case, let's go to our comments online. First to Paolo. Corriere, if you can please introduce yourself and, and to raise your feedback, please. Well, hello there, uh, Paulo Correa here. I am a member of an association which is called uh, the Council of the Brazilian Representatives Living Abroad. And uh, in order to address this question, I'd like to point out the role of the civil society in the, uh, the multi-stakeholder approach. Of course, uh, associations are uh, institutions that are in, contact, in constant contact with uh, the ground and obviously they are capable as well of uh, embracing uh, not only uh, relationships with uh, the public administration but also with uh, small um, entrepreneurs and citizens as well. And uh, there is another um, a point that I'd like to raise here is um, about the, um, the international cooperation and the participation of the diaspora in uh, those uh, processes. Um, most recently, uh, here in Italy, we have been seeing a change in, uh, in the normatives that states specifically uh, the importance of the diaspora members in the um, uh, development, development of their countries of origin, which leads also to their participation into processes of uh, international cooperation. And one modality in particular that is um, interesting is the decentralized cooperation, which involves the um, local public administration and then uh, is a way to strengthen the, the role of those associations at the local level as well. So this is just a, a reflection that I believe that uh, can um, give a very good example of how a multi-stakeholder approach can, can be done, uh, which includes the local administration, the associations uh, working locally and uh, their participation in a relationship with the uh, uh, local uh, institutions of their country of origin as well. So um, that's all. I uh, I I'd like to conclude um, thanking uh, all the the members of the organization uh, for this opportunity and wish uh, good luck on the uh, works here today. Thank you. Paolo, thank you so much, noting your points around civil society and also the very useful reflection on the, on the ways of which you can engage at decentralized level through decentralized cooperation and agree, indeed bringing that sub-national uh, perspective will be, very criti will be critically important. We have two further interventions, I believe, Louis, sorry, okay. So we had two interventions, but they have no longer got their hands up. Um, so perhaps we, what we can do is move to the next question. So I briefly mentioned a proposed structure for the Alliance. And as we heard, um, the government of Ireland have put their hands up to be the chair of the institutional committee steering committee. We have suggested the three working groups around sectoral areas of intervention, noting that we also had the request from Nigeria to broaden the thematic scope and the need for cross fertilization across 
uh, potential working groups. So the question to you is, where do you feel it would be important to include participation from members of the diaspora and other relevant partners? And here I would like to bring in the reflection from the previous point about the role of the UNMN. And indeed, IOM, as the convener of the UN United Nations Migration Network, has invited uh, a broader range of UN agencies to this consultation online, um, and it would be uh, excellent to hear from those invited how they see themselves, uh, but also reflecting on the broad rate of stakeholders that were participants of Dublin from academia to civil society, private sector, diaspora organizations and other actors. Um, so it would be great here to hear your feedback on the participation of the members of the diaspora and other relevant partners, who they should be, uh, particularly what role they can play and how we link the different levels of uh, the alliance together. And here also would be fantastic to hear from your own national or regional reflections, um, practices that we can build on hearing already that we have significant experience at national and regional level. So I turn first to the floor if we have further feedback from states. Israel. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I, I will take the chance of uh, what was asked before to then provide further information. But as a first reflection, I think that they should be everywhere. And, and I think that that's, that, that that's important, even if you are trying to do an institutional framework, uh, that, that is important. They have to be a partner. Uh, it shouldn't be only IOM, only UN entities, only states. Um, and one of the colleagues before also mentioned the importance of uh, having the variety of representation of the diaspora, but not, not only on national origins. And I think that that's important as well. Uh, th those, for example, who have disabilities or different ages, um, or things that are important to be addressed as problems and, and that they can bring their voices uh to to the discussion i think that it's very important that you know we give them a seat at the table we have that expression when we're talking about certain issues so i think that it's important to make sure that they they, they have a seat at the table and that they can be heard so i wouldn't say where where to put it but everywhere even at the expert level because sometimes at least here in geneva we we, we end up kind of in a bubble uh talking to each other and it will be important to to hear those voices as well uh there to bring us back to reality it's just uh, initial thoughts thank you Thank you so much, Israel, and indeed, diaspora will be everywhere. The modalities will need to be worked through. Um, and I very much hear your point about not just origin countries or national origins, but these different levels, ages, and the importance of addressing problems. And I think that comes to the core of what we have, have discussed so far, so very well noted. Uh, in the room, we also have Charles, our, our previous speaker. Sorry. Apologies, Germany, and then uh, Charles uh, from the AEM. Yeah, just very briefly, I, I, I would just like to, to echo and underline what my colleague from Israel has said. I think we cannot do this kind of uh, uh, work without the voices of the diaspora organizations, and I think uh, um, for, for the details of their, their future involvement and, and integration into the, to the policy dialogue, we will see. But I think it's, it's, it's absolutely necessary that, um, the voices of, of the diaspora organizations, um, will be heard and, and they should be part of the process. Thank you. Thank you, Germany. I will pass to Charles and then we have two reflections online and then we can move to the next question. And I think for questions of time, we will take one more question and then we will move towards the uh, conclusions and next steps. So over to you and thank you, Charles, for your patience. Thank you very much, Madam Chair Lady. And indeed, <clears throat> Billy number one, my colleague said, diasporas are everywhere and we are already somewhere with this initiative. I'm starting with the IUM. I think there's a lot we have achieved over the years because I can reflect upon how much support we got from the diaspora mission we led in Sierra Leone when the, Mr. Sanusi Savage was head of the IUM. And we were able to bring the huge amount of, biggest amount of diaspora team in Sierra Leone for short-term and medium-term projects. 
<clears throat> those data could be very useful to us in terms of mapping the way forward. And then that has even led to the creation of the Office of the Diaspora in the Ministry of Health in Sierra Leone, which is really, really something very good. And we have had mapping of diaspora in, in around the world that we can build upon. And coming back to my host country in Switzerland, there's a lot of initiative we can build upon. The Swiss government will be very supportive of the African Diaspora Council. Next week, we have a presentation I'll be sharing with the members of the Swiss government and private sector as well. And a week later also, we have the Swiss African Forum, which is a huge diaspora organization in Switzerland. We can build upon these initiatives to, to mark the way forward. And then around the globe also, we have for, in Rwanda, we have a diaspora organization. They have very interestingly friends of Rwanda which means you don't need to come from Rwanda to be part of the Rwanda diaspora. So those are initiatives that we can actually build upon in mapping the way forward so as to complement further efforts so that we don't reinvent the wheel or build upon what has already been done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charles. And like the point about bringing the diaspora in to map the diaspora, and I think this reflects on the tools that we already have, but also the experiences through long-standing programming to identify those diaspora, including the examples you brought from Somalia and from Rwanda. So thank you so much for that. Um, we have two colleagues online. We had Sarda Alf Aftab, apologies if your name is, if I have mispronounced your name, and Yasmina. Ben Slimane. So we'll start with Sadar, please. Hi. Uh, good good morning. It's still morning in England. Um, so I'm Aftab Khan from Kashmir Development Foundation, uh, based in England. For this particular question, I echo what uh, colleagues from Israel and Germany said before. But more importantly, uh, the the capacity of the diaspora to engage, different diasporas to engage at this level and their organization. Uh, we need to recognize um, those capacity issues uh, for, for, for diaspora organizations. And also um, where um, they are based and in different countries, uh, the policies of the um, countries, or the host countries of where the diasporas currently live. Um, and especially where um, the discrimination, racism, and other uh, impacts uh, experienced by the diaspora, um, and how can we uh, ensure uh, that those countries' uh, policies um, also uh, recognize the need for diaspora engagement and in terms of their integration in the society and a link with their international uh, development objectives and how they be part of through um, uh, IUM at this policy dialogue uh, for their um, countries of origin, um, how, 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 how we can link those priorities um, uh, uh, of that particular country, uh, international development priorities in the countries of origin of those diasporas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sadar, and I think you made some very important there about um, the cooperation, the capacity of diaspora to engage. I think that's a very useful reflection. I'll take one more comment from Yasmina Ben Slimane. We have two other colleagues online who have feedback, but as I mentioned before, we will go to a last question, and um, hopefully those two colleagues can also integrate their comments into the last question. So over to you, Yasmina. Hello everyone, thank you so much uh, for giving me the floor. So I stand uh, before you today as the gender specialist at the Migration Youth and Children Platform, as well as a young migrant from the Global South living as, in the, as a diaspora. My experiences, professional, personal and academic have shaped the understanding of the pressing issues faced by young people and the importance of engaging with the diaspora through a youth and gender lens within the migration context. Simply, we cannot turn a blind eye to the injustices and inequities that persist, that are perpetrated by systemic racism, sexism, ageism, and neocolonial structures within the humanitarian system. And we must confront these challenges and work, and work towards a world where youth, regardless of their gender and origin, can migrate with dignity, safety, and opportunity. 
So today I call upon member states and stakeholders to take action with three key points uh, for the global diaspora policy islands. Firstly, we must amplify the voices of youth and ensure their meaningful participation in all decision-making processes. And we must create safe spaces for them so that they can express themselves, their aspirations, their lived experiences, and contribute uh, with their innovative uh, ideas. Uh, secondly, adopting a gender lens is not an option. It is an absolute necessity. We must dismantle the barriers that hinder the progress of women and girls in migration. We must work towards eliminating gender-based violence and also safeguarding the rights of migrant women and girls. By doing so, we create a world where gender equality is not just an aspiration, but a lived reality for all. And lastly, engaging with the diaspora is not just about acknowledging their potential contributions, but it is about recognizing their humanity and addressing the injustices that they face. So again, we must dismantle those barriers that prevent diaspora youth and especially young women from fully participating in their community and ensure their voices are heard and valued. Together, we can build a future where the migration journey becomes a beacon of hope, resilience, and justice. And But for that to be happen, youth and gender perspectives must be at the forefront of our policies and actions. By engaging the diaspora with the youth and gender lens, we can challenge injustices and other barriers that affect the lives of young people. And it is through a collaborative effort that we can truly unleash the full potential of our global community. Thank you. Yasmina, thank you so much for your intervention and for your strong call to address the dimensions of youth and gender and particularly to address injustice. I think that was well heard. We have two other colleagues online. As I said, I, could, I will ask if you could please combine your intervention with the last question that we will raise now. But I will then also open the floor for any other interventions or comments that go beyond the uh, questions posed so far, so you are free to comment. And this last question is reflecting on the 2023 Sustainable Development Summit, which takes place this year. So the question here is, how do we envisage the role of diasporas in accelerating the implementation of the SDGs? And how can the Global Diaspora Policy Alliance support the global community to achieve impactful, transformative and inclusive initiatives? And I will turn to our colleagues online. And again, please um, do share your experiences, your reflections, and also welcome feedback from the floor and from our member states here as well. So in which case I turn to Luis Gutierrez online. Luis, if you can please open your microphone and I would very much welcome a combined answer to both questions. Thank you. Do you hear me? Hello? We can, we yes. can hear you loud and clear. Ah, okay. Thank you. I'm Luis Gutierrez, head of the Institute of the Mexicans Abroad of the Foreign Ministry of Mexico. So Mexico welcomes the installation of this consultation mechanism for the design of the Global Alliance for the Future of the Diaspora, and we are ready to participate actively by sharing best practices. So let me share one. Next September, we will launch the fourth edition of our Consular Entrepreneurship Program for Mexican Women Abroad, with the objective to train and provide tools to entrepreneur women to create and strengthen a business in their place of residence, in addition to promoting the empowerment of women in the economy and business. Past three editions had more than 1,200 migrant women from 40 Mexico representations in the U.S., two from Canada, two from Europe, and one from the Middle East. So I think we could, we could share this initiative with, with, with you, and we also want to see on the, on the platform, on the, on, the, on the Global Alliance, some tools for, for giving uh, best practices to the entrepreneurship for women. We had this alliance with universities and with our diaspora organizations all, all over the world. And uh, uh, we, we want to see uh, on, 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 on the building of this uh, uh, diaspora alliance, uh, I think two, two, two goals or two, uh, uh, we, 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 need to, we need to work on the mental health initiatives. We, 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 have, we have seen 
uh, the big impact of the pandemic on the on the mental health issues. We are deploying the some uh, networks in, in Europe, in Americas, with some university to provide some uh, consultation or remote consultation for our diaspora. So we, we have to think in building more or something more power tools to, to give this uh, help to, to the diaspora. And, and, and the third one, uh, we are having pro programs for higher education diaspora. So we, we are looking to, to have a conversation with the, the, the organizations on our diaspora or for individuals and uh, higher educated uh, living abroad to share the, the knowledge with the communities of the origin. So uh, I think these uh, three uh, 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 aspects we, we, we will include or we have to include on this uh, Global Alliance. Thank you. Thank you so much to the representative of Mexico and I very welcome your proposed role and the three points that you have raised and very much looking forward to uh, working with you more closely on all of these areas, including the request made for further tools to uh, ensure empowerment. So thank you so much for that. Uh, we also have, I think, two more uh, colleagues online. We have Ilona Ter. Ilona, if you can unmute and ask your question. Ilona, if you can hear us, if you can please unmute your mic. May, you may be having difficulties, Ilona, so please do feel free to leave your feedback into the chat. We will go to our last uh, colleague online, who is Aya Kasasa. Aya, if you can please open your microphone and ask your question. Oui, merci beaucoup. Ce n'est pas une question, mais plutôt un partage d'informations. Je vous remercie pour votre indulgence de me donner la parole à nouveau. Simplement pour vous informer que nous avons euh, une assemblée de parlementaires, une assemblée parlementaire ACP, donc qui représente les parlementaires de nos 79 États, et une assemblée parlementaire paritaire avec notre partenaire l'Union européenne, et que nous proposons de porter euh, cette information et cette question de l'Alliance mondiale diaspora euh, au débat de nos parlementaires, ce qui servira euh, également euh, à, à consulter euh, nos, nos, euh, nos partenaires dans les pays d'origine, mais également dans d'autres pays. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Aya. And we certainly welcome the collaboration with the OACPS and the collaboration that you have mentioned with us, and we certainly look forward to taking that forward. Uh, we have a final comment and question from Juan Pio, who is also online joining us, and then we will move to a broader comments and questions. Thank you, Juan. Uh, hello, yeah, good morning. <clears throat> Here calling from Ecuador, uh, Juan Pio Hernandez, based region in DC. I represent Plan País, a Venezuelan diaspora organization. We are also uh, the organizers of, of uh, and one of the coordinators of the Red Global de la Diaspora Venezuela, a global network. I think a very important uh, issue to, to to put in the into the conversation is the issue of youth and and how this developed. Like as you all know, like uh, a lot of the concerns out of the diaspora is that some countries might be losing their demographic bonus. And here at Plan Pais, we just. Uh, 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 published a study on, on the perspectives of Venezuelan youth and found that not only are, are this uh, demographic, demographic bonus a part of the development for the host countries, but through diasporas and the power of them, if we keep the diasporas linked with the country of origin and continuously uh, building networks, it's something that they could provide to the development of the country of origin. So I just want to commend uh, all this group, and I'm really happy to be part of of, uh, of this conversation. And really, I, I'm really inspired to with all the the experiences that I heard from from the African countries, from uh, Mexico, uh, from Brazil, and and, and 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 the Middle East, and all the all the other very successful or or very building diaspora groups are in there. So 
just wanted to bring the issue of youth and uh, and I think they they get, they got to be central to the SDGs and the summit. So um, so thank you very much, and I'm glad to hear for next steps. Thank you so much, Juan, and thank you for bringing your experience from Venezuela and to touch upon the importance of youth and the link to the SDG summit, and indeed the. Um, demographic dimensions are incredibly important and particularly in the context running up to the SDG summit. So that's very much appreciated. At this point, before we move to next steps and conclusions, uh, again, I would welcome broader feedback or comments, uh, inputs, ideas, suggestions from the floor and also online. And to reiterate, there have been many colleagues who have put their hands up and some who have asked for the floor and then have not been able to or have not appeared again online. So apologies, colleagues, where that's been the case. There will be further opportunities for you to provide input and this is the start of the process. I believe we have one comment online, well, one feedback online from a colleague called Paddy. Paddy, if you would like to open your microphone, please. Uh, thank you again. So, Paddy, uh, Paddy Sianga Kinston from the Global Research Forum on Diaspora and Transnationalism. I think uh, we I put some comments there in terms of the leadership around, and I thought that I should just echo that one again as we conclude. I think it's very important as we move forward to ensure that we have, um, for lack of a better word, a balanced uh, a balanced narrative and a balanced representation as well. So while we do appreciate the hand up that has been raised by Ireland, I think it's very important that we could also work around the advocacy uh, to ensure that we have, because of a lot of the things that we have raised today and the things that we have discussed today um, go into recognizing uh, diaspora beyond remittances but the issue of the youth that has been raised. I also just wanted um, maybe to bring that across as well that in terms of being very intentional in what we see as the role of the youth it would probably be advisable to have a youth representation also on this uh, on the leadership uh, for, for, uh, for the for the alliance itself. Uh, as to your question, I think in terms of the very immediate steps that you would see for the SDG summit, I mean, it's coming up in the, in the next couple of months and we still seem to be in a formulation stage here today, only hearing uh, more details, of course, in the next couple of months. But I wonder whether we could also just be very concrete in terms of bringing out what are the very concrete um, <clears throat> things that we haven't been able to tackle on the national and on the regional, but also amplifying what these voices look like, but amplifying what the different issues like. I think that would be quite useful for SDG summit coming forward, and particularly looking that we have even now, you know, less than 10 years for the kind of actions that we've committed to as countries uh, for the SDGs. Thank you. Paddy, thank you so much, and thank you for, for reinforcing the dimension of bringing in youth and uh, echoing the need to make sure that youth are brought in throughout the process. Um, I take your points about the immediate steps to the SDG summit and the need to be more concrete, and we will revert on that, of course. And I think your point is very well taken about the amplification uh, requirements here as well. I, at this point, again, open to any final comments before we move to next steps. I'm just looking around the room to see if anyone else would like to speak and also to check online once again. Okay. At this point, before we move to closing remarks, and I pass the floor to my colleague Monica to come and uh, deliver those remarks, um, just to briefly talk about what our next steps will be. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the first step will be to share with you all the materials from today, including um, the PowerPoint presentations, the Dublin Declaration, the questions that we have asked you, the overview of the structure that we have presented to you. The step after that, as I mentioned, will be to communicate with you likely after the summer with a proposal. There will be steps in between in terms of consultations, no doubt, and for further feedback 
to uh, see how that can be incorporated into those proposals. And we will come back also with a proposal on how that might look, whether it be the portal, whether we harness idea aspirate as the modus operandi, or whether there's another platform beyond the um, email communication you can use. And then the, once the proposal has been put together, um, there will be um, a formal launch, there will be ongoing consultations bringing in the different perspectives and therefore at that point the structures will be put in place and more information will be given on what that will look like. But as I said, for the moment it's, we are very much in the consultation phase, so please do reach out uh, with any comments or questions that you have or any suggestions and we very much welcome them. And at this point, I would like to just one, one more thing. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, we have been receiving also questions online in a written form, and we will address those. Um, I have tried to address them as they come, but be, be ensured that your comments will also feed this consultation. Just wanted to, to mention that and thank all the participants online also. Thank you. Thank you, Liz and uh, Larissa, and thanks uh, to all who have uh, joined us today, both in the room and online. I think that what we heard is encouraging. There is certainly a momentum and a need. And as uh, I said, and the Irish ambassador said as well this morning, this is just the beginning of a process. And I think that it shows that it is an inclusive process. It is a multi-stakeholder process. And we count on all of you to help us bringing the right people uh, into the room, the, the room here, the virtual room. I think what happens often with these hybrid meetings, there's a lot of people online, but the, there is no faces. And so it's difficult to see who's online. And I would suggest that in addition to the notes of this meeting and the presentations, we also share a list of participants to just uh, for you in the room, understand who all has been uh, online. Um, just to reiterate that for the Director General and also for the DDG Daniels, diaspora is very important. They just came from a round of regional um, policy coordination committee meetings in the different regional offices and in each of them diaspora was mentioned as a key area of work a transversal area of work rather than a, a vertical one, seeing diasporas as partners in all the different thematic areas. So we, we want to uh, engage also with our own structure that they can reach out to their counterparts at regional level, at country level, to really ensure that we have a participation that is truly uh, global and, and inclusive. And, uh, and we look forward to the next steps, to engaging with all of you, to getting your comments and feedbacks, and to launch the Global Policy Diaspora Alliance with, uh, with its best structure. So thank you very much, and uh, have a nice lunch, those who are having it here, and those online, or breakfast, or dinner. Thank you.